Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday Night Live. Uh, first of all, a couple of things. I do read the comments uh, on YouTube. So, to some of you, <clears throat> but some of you, great. Uh, thank you. I hope you feel that this show's pretty measured and I ask a question rather than just uh, give people my own opinion. Imagine having your own opinion and being a South East London right wing comedian. I've been looking at some stuff. That Nish Kumar don't like me. I'm really, really pleased. Um, right. The other thing is, yeah, I apologise for the glasses being on the wonk. Uh, someone said my ear, one of my ear holes was up uh, the other. It's like the old joke, isn't it? What happens if you cut a man's ears off? He goes blind because his hat falls over his head. But no, it's because I've got so many glasses. I've got looking out the window glasses where I can look out the window and see things. And I've got, but I can't read. I have to have extensions on my arm to read like that. And uh, et cetera, et cetera. I remember doing an eye test to get my driving license in Dubai and my eyes were shit, right? And I didn't have uh, my glasses at the time. I didn't have glasses, but they were just shit. I always thought I was permanently hung over, you know, and you're fucking like that. And uh, so I went in to have my eye test. And unless you passed your eye test, you couldn't get a driving license in Dubai. And I thought, well, good, I can start again here. Do, you know, my other driving license, more points than Crystal Palace. That ain't hard. And so I stood there thinking, oh, shit, I'm not going to do this. And I stood behind a bloke. Uh, a Pakistani bloke who, who read the thing off. It was only four lines, A, D, F, G, F thing. So, so I just remembered what he said. Said the same. You couldn't make it up. Anyway, so uh, the glasses are now good. So I've got the looking out of the windows and I've got the readings. And I've also got dark glassy looking out the window sunglasses, Ray-Bans, you know what I mean, Tom Cruise call. And I've got the reading the book in the dark glasses, which is sort of a bit Ray Charlesy. But here we go. OK, so before uh, we start, next Sunday, right, because JDTV is having a bit of a facelift. And soon we'll be opening another channel with a load of documentaries that Robert Garofalo has, has shot. And they're fantastic, including one about the parachute division, which I did the voiceover for. So it's all related to what I think people uh, want to watch. So next Sunday, you must remember this, next Sunday the show is at 7.30, OK? Not 6 o'clock, it's at 7.30. But as you know, it's not live and then disappears. You can click on it and watch it any time. You can, you can click on it, you know, it's like having your own little DVD collection. Talking of which, people have said, what is the best DVD you've done and where do we get it? Well, I have to say that Cinderella 1 and Cinderella 2 were the best uh, DVDs in the world. And if you want to see my DVDs, um, go to uh, www.jimdavidson.org. Okay, that's not... Um, the UK for the TV, it's org, org, uh, org, okay, here's the best one, look at that, Jim Davidson's uh, Silver Jubilee, this was 25 years in the business, God knows how I've lasted that long, and I shot this on tour, and we took two 40 foot truckloads of gear and a band with this, it was great, old smudger, no longer with us, uh, fantastic, and I really, really enjoyed this, I did it years ago, there's one here somewhere, years ago, this one, this one, this one, I first ever took a band. It was 1980, I think, or something ridiculous, or 82, 81. I can't remember. Live at Blazers with George Sava used to run it. And, uh, and we had lasers on stage. No one had ever seen lasers apart from the rock people. In fact, these belonged to a band called The Who. Yes, The Who. And, uh, and so they put them on. You had to gas them down, apparently. I don't know. What's other? So they left them on after we did the tech run. And it was in a nightclub in Windsor. And before the people came in, all the bread rolls were out on the thing. All the stuff was getting ready. George was running around. Hello, love. Everything OK? What's these two great fucking beams going across the club? Oh, they're lasers, George. Don't worry about it. Anyway, someone pressed the curtains <coughs> to close. And they closed. And the lasers cut them in half like James Bond's bollocks. And so people were squirting foam on stuff to put the curtains out because they caught fire. And uh, oh, oh, it was such a fun, we were all laughing our heads off. And George said, you're laughing, love. My fucking livelihood's burning down. So that was that. The two risky video. God, how old was I in that? And I turned up by helicopter. Imagine all this bloody money I've wasted. There's a few here, actually. So go and have a look at them. We don't put them all on the, the TV. Because sometimes it's nice to, I don't even know what's on that one. Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Blue jokes. Why the... 
blue jokes. I suppose that was Max Miller. Do you want them out the blue book or do you want them out the white book? These are out the blue book. Okay, so let's have a little... Oh, there's another one as well I did here in, uh, in Great Yarmouth. I, I, I don't know if you've ever been uh, in Great Yarmouth. I used to own the pier there. And, and of course, the pier don't go over the sea in Great Yarmouth. It stops halfway because they, they nearly run out of wood. And when I first met Francine Lewis, oh, what a talented girl and beautiful, beautiful girl. No chance, I'm afraid. Anyway, still trying. Nothing, not a card, not a letter. So I go up to see my theatre, which someone was putting on an early summer show about June. OK, I had Bradley Walsh on there in the after that bit. But the early bit, would you believe it, to the shame of myself, and I'm going to have to dig myself up and look round for any statues of me and pull them down, was the black and white minstrel show. Now, I just owned the theatre. I'm just having a cop out here. I take the knee and I would say that it was a pile of shit, that black and white minstrel show. Never really liked it, but it was packed, packed. And I stood in the wings chatting to Francine Lewis, telling her I was a big film producer and everything, and how well I've got play. Anyway, so I, I, you know, it was a bit Weinstein-y, to be honest. And, um, and a little bloke came off, right, a, a minstrel, a black-faced person with a wig, and he went, hello. I went, hello, you don't sound like you're from Kentucky. He went, it's me, Simon. I still didn't put two and two together. So he lifted the little bit of black wig up. There was a white bit there, as if that would make any fucking difference. Simon. I said, oh, Simon Bashford. Do you remember me? I did the pantomime with you. I was the ugly sister. Oh, yeah, and you a dirty bugger. Kept showing, pulling his skirt up to the people in the front row. Played it like a drag act. He was fantastic, actually. And now he's a black and white minstrel. And I said, how's it going? Oh, it's fucking awful. No one's, he's light on his feet, obviously. No one's uh, paid any, been paid any bloody money by the producer. No, no, the laser people, they've all gone. The lighting people, they've packed up. They won't do anything. And it's fucking awful. I tell you, it's freezing up here. It's fucking awful. I've never started. Oh, just a minute. And he walked on stage and went, we we toss and tail and we land in jail. And walked back off two foot and started fucking, oh, well, I'm going to fucking turn it. I've never seen a transformation like it. This is show business, folks. Even though the black and white minstrels are put where they belong in the bin. Even though Lenny Henry, sir, Lenny Henry, that's a box to tick, isn't it? Eh? Sir Lenny Henry is, uh, was involved in it. I'm sure he, he didn't know any better then. And now he's moved on. He's a, a fantastic comedian, of course. Um, I'm going to speak now uh, to the government. Boris and, and people from uh, the government, you've got to open theatres, OK? I've noticed that the convicts are dropping. Uh, 730 new cases in a country of 60 million, growing by 1,000 every day from Dover, obviously. Um, you've got to open the theatres. But don't just say they're opening now and they can only do half business, because that's no good. You don't, they don't have half business. They need full business. They need full business to work. Not only that, they, you can't just say they're open tomorrow and put a show on. It takes six months to sell a show. So please, Boris... Please, Rishi, you're a great Chancellor, Spock. Please tell Boris we need the theatres open in January. <clears throat> January, February, but let's do it now. Have a guess. Spin the wheel. How many lives will be involved? Otherwise, the industry, as people call it, will, it will be over. It will be forgotten. You know, me, I've not worked since last March and I won't work until next year. I might not even do that unless people open the theatres now. All those cruise ships that are parked up in Weymouth, all the dancers, all the technicians, all the waiters, all the everybody's, everybody is out of work. We've got to start taking a chance. We'll take precautions and, and we'll oh, get the theatres open, Boris, for Christ's sake. OK, then. Right. OK, then, you YouTubers. <sighs> Don't forget, it's a bit later next Sunday. See you then. I don't care, do I? <laughs>